aspect was we need to understand the opacities of our process material because we've seen that many important properties of transients uh, actually strongly depend on the uh, on the opacity, such as the peak time scales, the peak luminosity, and everything. So the opacities really determine uh, where the transient is, is sort of going to peak. Is it go going to peak in the optical, or is it going to peak in the near infrared? So which telescopes actually do we have to use in order to identify them? So uh, that is really a very crucial sort of basic microphysics ingredient. And it turns out to be a very, very challenging um, um, subject. Um, trying to determine the opacities of our process material. That's much, much easier for supernovae, um, where we are only dealing with uh, sort of iron peak, what people call iron peak um, compositions. And then f finally, we also need to know the characteristics of the ejector material beyond opacity, meaning we need to understand how we actually get neutron-rich ejector, in this case, from uh, neutron star mergers. So what, how much mass do they eject? Uh, what kind of velocities do these ejector have? What kind of sort of uh, density profiles uh, do they have? And uh, we need to know the composition, the initial composition, because that is sort of the input for the R process. And, and the composition that is for the opacities will depend, strongly depend on this input. So we need to know this. And uh, for all these three aspects, um, and that's something I want to wanna highlight that uh, uh, Louis mentioned uh, uh, this morning and, and, and this afternoon, how the, about the importance of numerical uh, techniques and numerical computations. Because if we didn't do any, if we weren't able to do any numerical computations at all, we were essentially done with what I presented <laughs> this morning. Um, all of these microphysics, um, uh, um, sort of uh, in, in investigating all, all of these uh, microphysics aspects requires fairly sophisticated numerical um, techniques and, and computations. And that's essentially the only way how we can uh, advance our understanding uh, about these microphysics. Um, and the, 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 the problem really being that small details in these microphysics can, can sort of cause qualitative differences in, in the outcomes, meaning in, in, in the actual nature of the, of the transient that we're that we going to observe. So uh, let me start with the, the nuclear power supply. And that, uh, of course, uh, leads me to just very briefly discuss uh, the, the R process, just to, to give you a primer on the on the R process, I'll be talking a little bit in, in a little bit more detail about this um, in, in in Wednesday's colloquium. Um, but okay, here's the here's the thing. Um, the R process uh, is uh, the so-called rapid neutron capture process. So essentially, back in the 50s, um, it has been realized that all elements heavier than iron, um, which is actually most of the periodic table, if, um, if, you, if you look at the periodic table, most of the elements actually have to be uh, formed by neutron capture. So there's no way you can uh, fuse elements essentially beyond the iron peak where you've exhausted all the, the nuclear binding energy for fusion. Um, and to go sort of beyond this, uh, um, uh, this iron peak, you have to uh, do some other tricks. And in this case, uh, what you can do is, is, is a neutron capture. And so the idea is essentially you capture free neutrons in some outflow of material onto some seed nuclei. And uh, these, uh, that has to be, of course, a very neutron-rich environment, uh, an environment that has a lot of free neutrons. And of course, one environment you can immediately think of is, of course, neutron star mergers. Um, Although the, 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 the earliest uh, site that had been uh, proposed for this process was actually uh, supernovae, core collapse supernovae, because there you also have, you form a proton neutron star and you have uh, new, very neutron rich material at the surface of the neutron star. And if you drive winds off that uh, uh, neutron star, um, of course you have um, material with a lot of free neutrons available. So that is also a an, an, uh, uh, potential site. And I'll discuss this more on, on Wednesday in, in the colloquium. Now, there's two variants of this uh, process. 
there's um, there are say two regimes. Uh, so there's one regime that, that we call slow neutron capture, or the so-called S process, in which the time scale for capturing such a neutron um, onto a C particle is actually much longer than for the resulting nucleus to beta decay. So the point is that if you if you just bombard uh, seed nuclei with uh, free neutrons, they become unstable. So uh, uh, because uh, sort of uh, very neutron-rich isotopes uh, become unstable simply because sort of for roughly uh, stable nuclei, for stable nuclei you require roughly equal numbers of protons and neutrons to stabilize the, the nucleus. So this is essentially, so this pointer is not really working well, but um, so you can see that down in this diagram, this is essentially the sort of nuclear chart where uh, you plot neutron number versus uh, uh, neutron number versus proton number, and sort of the stable isotopes are uh, indicated here with these uh, black dots. So these are all the stable ones, and uh, but sort of bombarding some of stable some of these with uh, more neutrons, you can get uh, sort of off from this uh, center of called valley of beta stability that you may know from from nuclear physics courses, and if you uh, sort of uh, bombard uh, these uh, uh, these seed nuclei slow enough, then they can always beta decay into stable isotopes. Um, before sort of capturing a new neutron. So with the slow um, um, neutron capture process, the, the, the S process, you would always form stable nuclei. So if you start with some sta uh, stable seed nucleus here um, and you capture neutrons slowly, you're just going to follow this uh, path up here in the, in the center of beta uh, stability. The other regime is uh, in which these, this neutron capture occurs on a time scale that is much shorter than for the resulting nucleus to beta decay. So in this case, you just bombard this seed nucleus with a lot of neutrons, and, that's, and that resulting nucleus doesn't have enough time to adjust to this bombardment, essentially. So it just acquires neutrons and neutrons and neutrons. And so you go off uh, from these stable isotopes and uh, into sort of uh, this red path that you can see up there, which is sort of um, um, way off from, this, uh, from, this, from the center of this value of beta stability. And that's that's exactly what what the R process is about. Um, you capture, you have some seed nuclei, um, and then you capture free neutrons. Um, you go all the way to very high neutron numbers, produce fairly exotic nuclei, and at some point, the uh, these these free neutrons are consumed, and you just end up with a bunch of very heavy stuff up here. I, I can't point to it, unfortunately, um, and uh, those. Uh, nuclei then have to decay back to stable isotope in the center of uh, beta stability um, on much much longer time scales, meaning time scales of you know min seconds, minutes, hours, days, and even years and 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 months and and uh, years and and, and uh, several years and so on. So I can I'll just quickly illustrate to you this um, how this actually works. Um, this is using some simulation data from from my own simulations. Um, running a uh, full nuclear reaction network, um, trying to follow some initial, um, so this is essentially a fluid trajectory, so think of it like as a fluid element that is ejected sort of from the neutron star merger site, and this uh, is ejected into outer space, and it undergoes the R process. And so initially, once we are still at the merger site, uh, we start with stable isotopes indicated here in this, this so this color scheme um, indicates the abundance of nuclei that we have. The gray area is essentially all the nuclei that we uh, sort of potentially know of that can potentially be formed. Uh, the stable ones being at the center, essentially. Um, again, this is the sort of nuclear chart of uh, proton number versus uh, neutron number. And as this, so this is a movie, I'll, I'll play this now. You can also see that, I'm sorry, you can also see, should point out that um, on top, there's uh, I've written the the temperature and density and uh, and the time scale. So watch watch these scales as as the movie um, uh, as I'll play the movie. You see, we start with fairly hot temperatures of sort of 10 gigakelvin or so, which is a typical temperature of material that's ejected from from the merger site. And um, under these conditions, uh, we are in the regime of what physicists call the so-called uh, nuclear statistical equilibrium, and that will form stable nuclei. Um, up to sort of iron, if you want, and that is exactly what we are, what is indicated here with these uh, 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 with these uh, isotopes uh, up here. And once we drop, once we go below a certain temperature, in this case, uh, 
roughly something like uh, a few gigakelvin, which is pretty much now. Uh, so we've we've expanded away from this merger site, and now um, at some point this nuclear statistic, uh, nuclear statistical equilibrium breaks down, and neutron capture sets in. So all the free neutrons that are still available in, in this fluid element, in, in, in the flow, will have to capture onto the seed particles that we've produced uh, so far. So, and this is exactly what you can see now. N now we are actually starting to capture, so there's some oscillations because of, a, because of some turbulence, and then now you can see we've, we've moved to the right um, off from the stable isotopes by capturing the first neutrons onto the seed particles. And now we, are, we continue capturing neutrons and go all the way up to very high, to very high neutron numbers, uh, neutron numbers of um, sort of about 200 or so. These are essentially all unstable nuclei. They have all much more uh, neutrons than protons. And right now, on a time scale of roughly a second or so, so in this case, like 0.6 seconds, um, we actually ran out of these three neutrons, you can see that we, we, we went up to here, nothing, nothing, nothing happens anymore. We consumed all these neutrons, and now uh, sort of all these very exotic nuclei have to decay, beta decay, mostly beta decay, um, sort of horizontally back to stable isotopes at the center of the valley of beta stability. And this is exactly happening now. So we ran out of these neutrons, now they gradually decay, and the time scale now uh, speeds up quite a lot. We are, we're now at like two seconds, and now uh, sort of this goes now uh, fairly fast into uh, days, years, and then and then finally sort of we we end up with stable isotopes um, that have a very characteristic abundance pattern. That is what we call abundance pattern. We plot we plot the abundances or the essentially the number densities of nuclei as a function of their mass number a, which is n plus c, right? So neutrons plus protons. Um, and uh, you see this characteristic abundance pattern that shows some peaks, and I'll talk about this in, in, in a little more detail on, 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 on Wednesday. That is what we call the so-called first, second, and third um, R process peak. Um, and let me just play this movie just once more, um, just to illustrate another point. Um, so in capturing these neutrons, we form these very neutron-rich nuclei. And... Uh, as they then, so once the, the, the R process stopped, like after a time scale of a second or so, um, as I mentioned, all these very exotic isotopes have to decay to a stable ones. And so sort of going horizontally in this, in this direction. And in doing so, they release nuclear binding energy because that's essentially what they do. And they do this via, as I mentioned, beta decay, but there's also alpha decay from very heavy isotopes. Um, and also there's fission. So some of those very high, very heavy, uh, and very neutral-rich nuclei will also fission. And uh, sort of, and, and, the, and the question that we need to address now is um, how much nuclear binding energy do we actually get out of this process? Um, and that then also involves um, um, asking the question of how efficiently do these decay products, meaning the alpha particles, the electrons, and sort of the fission products, how do they uh, deposit their energy in the outflow? So how do they actually heat um, the outflow? Okay. So this heating rate, let me, let me stop here. So if you look at the, at the heating rate that you get from some of these numerical calculations, um, it shows this uh, characteristic pattern you see over here, where essentially on a time scale of a second, you have sort of roughly a constant heating rate. So this is the actual R process. This is while we are still capturing uh, neutrons onto these seed particles. And then after the R process actually stopped, uh, we see sort of power law decline in this heating rate. And uh, let me just ex explain this in a, in, in a little bit more detail. So if you wanted to fit this sort of analytically, um, you, can, you can essentially use something like uh, the following function.
can then divide this by pi to the power of alpha. And so roughly, at early times, this is just constant. Um, so at early times, this is sort of roughly the sort of initial heating rate. This is for sort of T smaller than T0, which is essentially one second, which is the time scale for the neutron capture process, for the R process. And then at late times, it is proportional to a power law in time, T to the minus alpha, where alpha is through these sort of nuclear network uh, uh, calculations, you, you can, you, you'll find that alpha is, is typically on the order of 1.3. And that's actually fairly interesting because if you look at, like, uh, just empirically at like how nuclear waste from, uh, from reactors, how, they, how such uh, um, um, sort of waste actually decays, it's exactly the same power law. Mm. And the reason is that what we have so remember this this movie. Uh, so we had this. Oops, why can't I? Wanted to show the final frame. No, it doesn't. Um, so remember we had this sort of statistical ensemble of a lot of these neutron-rich isotopes that decay. All of them have their own decay timescale. So what essentially happens is that uh, while an initial well, it's just a single uh, isotope um, has a decay, or say, a heating uh, um, sort of uh, decay function that goes like an exponential with a characteristic time scale. If you superimpose all of those, so if this is log of the heating rate, and this is log of time, you'd have initially sort of constant and then transitioning into this power law t to the minus alpha. And uh, this simply occurs because you have the statistical ensemble of a lot of isotopes that decay on their own uh, time scales. So it's just um, a huge sum, essentially, of uh, these exponential functions, and they just superimpose uh, to a power law. And that's exactly also what happens in, in nuclear waste. We also have a statistical ensemble of isotopes. And uh, so, therefore, it's not a surprise they also um, sort of superimpose to give a power law at late times. Okay, so this is the, uh, the heating rate. And sort of for a crude model, um, so in the, in the formalism that I described this morning, uh, you could essentially sort of parameterize these, the, the heating um, sort of with this function and play around with some parameters to explore different uh, sort of phenomena. So this is one thing how you could sort of uh, uh, include this into a fairly simple model for, um, for kilonovi. Uh, I have to mention that uh, essentially this heating only applies really, so this power law only really applies if you have a very neutron-rich outflow. Um, so if you produce actually a lot of lanthanides, uh, so this is, these are the very heavy elements uh, beyond the so-called second um, R process peak. Um, only then you have really this huge statistical ensemble of nuclei and you get a nice power law. You have actually what we call this blue kilonova um, type where uh, you don't produce lanthanides, so it, the, the, the outflow was actually not very neutron rich. Then, uh, then, you, then actually uh, individual isotopes sometimes dominate the heating. And that's, uh, you can see this here in the, in the figure on the right hand side, which I took from Lipunoy and Roberts. Um, and you can see that if you uh, so the neutron richness is parameterized by this um, parameter called the electron fraction. And this is really just for historical reason called the electron fraction because it's really a proton fraction. It's the number of densities of protons uh, to uh, the ratio of the number of densities of protons to the total number of baryons in the system, meaning the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So meaning that if Ye is small, um, you, end, you only have fairly... A small number of protons relative to neutrons, so it's very neutron rich. So, so y e small means neutron rich. And so, as you scale this parameter of the outflow, as you can see in this figure, up to higher values where you already have then equal numbers of protons and neutrons in the system for y e 0.5 
you can see that sort of these these curves become uh, show some wiggles and, and and bumps in these kind of things, and that's because individual isotopes actually um, uh, dominate the heating, and that has to be taken into account. And also the overall heating rate is actually reduced for for these sort of blue type uh, kilonova uh, transients. Um, but in general, still, you can sort of fairly well approximate things with a, a power law, if you want, just for a sort of a crude model. Now, I mentioned that the, the actual heating that we need for a kilonova model is given by the, by the sort of intrinsic heating rate that comes from the, the release of nuclear binding energy, multiplied by some thermalization efficiency. So this is... Um, Again, our nuclear, nuclear heating rate for our kilonova model. And this is the intrinsic rate multiplied by some thermalization efficiency. And then also the mass fraction of our process elements in our outflow times the mass that we have um, at this given velocity coordinate. So now, fine, we know, we know this. This essentially goes like t to the minus alpha at late times. But what about this? Um, this can uh, dramatically change uh, the, the actual heating that, that goes into the ejector and, and, and into, into the final luminosity. And, okay, so. Thermalization efficiency. Um, the problem is that the radioactive decay products thermalize differently. So, on the one hand, we have neutrinos from the beta decays. So again, just to remind you, so the radioactive decays that we are talking about here is alpha decay. We have beta decay. And we have fission. So the neutrinos are lost entirely. So material the typical uh, densities we are talking about for these transients, once they have expanded to, to length scales of 10 to the 15 centimeters, um, are in, uh, totally um, sort of transparent to neutrinos. So the energy that goes into neutrinos is entirely lost. Um, what about gamma rays? We have gamma rays from those, uh, from those decays. And those gamma rays typically are on the nuclear energy scale, meaning MEVs, right? Um, that's the, the typical energy that, they, that they'll have. And uh, those are actually trapped, but only at early times, when the density is still fairly high. And by early times, I mean, typically, if you, if you compute the, uh, the cross-section, so for, just to, to remind you, for the, 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 the important opacity, so the important absorption process for gamma rays is electron scattering. And for electron scattering, the cross-section goes, so if this is energy, the, at, at low energies, essentially, the cross-section is dominated by Thomson scattering. And uh, the cross-section is just the Thomson, so sigma equals sigma Thomson, the Thomson um, scattering. Uh, which has a fixed value independent of energy, so this is um, um, so this is elastic scattering. And then once the energies of gamma rays become comparable to those of the electrons, meaning uh, comparable to me c squared, uh, scattering becomes highly inelastic. So it, uh, the Thomson scattering goes over into Coulomb scattering. And for Coulomb scattering, there's this sort of Klein-Nishina regime. that actually dramatically reduces the opacity, uh, the, 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 the cross-section at high energies. So if you're in the, in the MEV, um, and that also depends on, on the density, um, you can actually you can significantly reduce um, sigma and then uh, become transparent for high energy 
gamma rays at, at late times. And that's typically on time scales of longer than one day, which is exactly the time scale of, of the peak for the, for, the, for the kilonova. So the point is that once we see the kilonova peaking, the gamma rays will, 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 have already, will already be uh, lost entirely. So we can't count on them. Now, the, the other particles, alpha particles and the electrons, and also the, the fission fragments, they are thermalized more efficiently. And how efficiently? That is what essentially this plot shows here. Um, so that's a detailed um, study of this uh, thermalization effect of these decay products uh, numerically. Um, done by Jennifer Barnes and uh, collaborators in 2016, which was essentially the first really detailed study of, of this type. Um, and so on the left-hand side here, um, I should have, should have called this here F, essentially because that is really what they, so to be consistent with the plots, that's what they essentially plot. So this is the thermalization uh, fraction. Um, and you can see that so for gamma rays, that's the green line. Gamma rays are lost, as you can see here, on a time scale of, of a day or so. So after um, a day, essentially none of the gamma rays are really thermalized anymore. Just leave the ejector and, 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 and their energy is lost. They, they don't heat. And, for, uh, and then you can see that for uh, the next uh, more efficient uh, particle species are the, the electrons, the beta particles, uh, indicated by this red band. And this red band just indicates different sort of model scenarios. But typically, they are sort of the next uh, level of, of efficiency. Uh, and then the, the alpha particles, uh, indicated here in blue. Um, and finally, uh, most efficiently, um, um, we have the, uh, the fission fragments um, that um, um, sort of uh, thermalized most efficiently. Now, this is just like sort of an up, uh, thought in ab absolute, uh, absolute terms, but um, if you actually look how much of those particles are typically produced in a typical R process um, scenario in neutron star mergers, um, you'll find the results here on the, on the right hand side. Um, so, in, the, in this bottom panel, um, you essentially follow the R process along such a trajectory as I've shown you. Uh, as this movie was, was showing you. Essentially, you focus on the same fluid trajectory, you follow it, you follow the R process, and then all the subsequent uh, nuclear decays. And you look at how much um, of these decays actually produce alphas, uh, how many gammas, gammas are produced, how many uh, betas are produced, and how many, how many fission fragments are produced. Um, and then, uh, relative to the, to the total um, energy that is uh, generated at a, at a given time, and so you can see that essentially early on, so fission is only important like very early on, like uh, sort of w within the first day or so. Um, then sort of we have some alphas that come out mostly at later times. And, uh, and the reason for this is because um, you produce a lot of actinides. So if, if, if you're fairly neutron rich, you produce a lot of actinides. So very, very heavy um, R-process nuclei. And they uh, mostly decay through, uh, through alpha uh, decays. And they have fairly long decay time scales. So this is why the alpha sort of turn on um, at late times. Um, and then you have um, a lot of beta decay. You, you can see, which is sort of roughly constant on a time scale of 30 days. They actually decrease um, on, on longer time scales. And that's when the, the alphas really take over. And there's some interesting physics that's, um, that, that, that can be done with this in the next couple of years. Um, and then even on top of that, you, you see that a lot of energy actually comes out, the most energy actually comes out in the gammas, but they are actually lost from the system, so unfortunately. Um, in the top plot, you can then see if you multiply essentially the two plots, so the plot on the left-hand side, which sort of tells you the intrinsic, um, the, the intrinsic thermalization efficiency with how much you actually produce, uh, and then you get sort of the, the total thermalization efficiency, in a sense, that weights all the species according to their overall energy um, contribution. And so there, again, the picture is fairly similar. Um, you, you can see that fission still um, is only um, of minor importance and um, only for a day or so. Um, 
the, the gammas that actually produce most of the energy are only important at very early times because the efficiency uh, drops very rapidly and sort of pushes their co energy contribution to zero, essentially. So you can forget about them. Um, and then, essentially, most uh, efficiently, you see the, mo the, the dominant contribution actually comes from, from the beta decays, uh, at least on time scales of a month um, or so. Um, but later on, uh, in, in some scenarios at least, these alpha decays can actually take over. And, and, and there's, yeah, as I mentioned, there's interesting physics that we can, that we can discuss about at some point. Um, so what kind of effect does this have on kilonova light curves? Um, that's summarized essentially by this plot. Um, so here you see different scenarios. So let's, let's focus on the, on the, on the plot in the, in the, at the center. Um, that sort of shows a fiducial kilonova model again for you know typical parameters, fairly neutron-rich outflow. Um, and if you just took the total amount of nuclear binding energy that is released um, by the the R process, you would get this blue curve, which means that everything is just thermalized uh, to 100%. And uh, the green line shows you if if only the gamma rays um, are um, sort of taken out. Um, meaning that uh, the thermalization of uh, gamma rays is tracked in the in the calculation, and already then you sort of get a quite significant decrease by a factor of a few. Uh, now, if you then also account in uh, for the alpha and the uh, for the efficiency of the alpha and the beta particles, um, you can see that actually uh, the luminosity drops at least by a factor of a few at peak light. So when the light curve peaks. Um, and by almost an order of magnitude or even more at, at later times. So uh, including uh, like very detailed calculations on how these, all these nuclear decays actually thermalize is very important because you may uh, over underestimate uh, kilonova light curves by actually orders of magnitude and brightness. Um, and uh, that is obviously very important if you're an observer and you, you actually want to point the telescope and, 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 and want to know um, uh, what you're actually looking for. The, the other two... Uh, scenarios are uh, essentially if, uh, for sort of other um, uh, nuclear physics parameters. So the, the above one is sort of going to lower ejector masses and higher velocities, and there you can see that the, the discrepancy is even, is even much higher between the sort of 100% uh, efficiency of thermalization, the blue curve, and the final red curve that includes all the, the thermalization. So by a, by a time scale of a month or so, you would, you would um, over-predict the kilonova by essentially two orders of magnitude, which is quite a lot. Um, and then the other bottom, so the bottom scenario is essentially for uh, more material and slower ejector velocities, and there the difference is not um, too big. It's maybe on the, on the factor of a few level or so. So depending on, on, again, the characteristic um, ejector, uh, the characteristics of the ejector, you can have um, um, very different um, sort of outcomes. And um, so you have to combine this all self-consistently, meaning we need to know what the characteristics of the outflow actually are, and then we can compute the thermalization efficiencies, and then only then we can make an actual really good prediction for what the kilonova um, uh, looks like. Um, also, I, I should mention that essentially this total thermalization efficiency that you see here, this, this uh, dashed line, this da uh, dashed black line, can also be sort of analytically uh, parameterized. So um, uh, you can also sort of, in a simple kilonova model, just um, for given initial conditions, you can sort of parameterize this curve and, and then also take this into a sort of simple kilonova model to, to, to fit some light curves. Um, I, I won't write it down here because it's 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 fairly detailed and it doesn't matter too much. Um, all right, let's get to the uh, to the second point of the the opacities of um, our process uh, nuclear synthesis material, um, because as we derived in the earlier this uh, today, um, the peak time scale, the luminosity, everything, and also uh, most importantly the spectra depend very much on on this opacity. Um, now, the opacity, as I mentioned, depends very sensitively on the composition of the material, meaning what the R process actually produced, um, what kind of nuclei the R process actually produced. Um, and uh, the reason will become obvious in, 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 in just a minute or so. Let me just point out like, what the typical outcomes of the R process uh, actually look like in terms of uh, abundance patterns. So 
this plot here shows um, outcomes of our process nuclear synthesis calculations. So again, numerical nuclear network calculations. And uh, so what um, uh, Lipuna and Roberts did here is essentially varying the electron fraction, again, parameterizing essentially the number of free neutrons you have in the system, and then sort of uh, following the R process and then look at the final abundance pattern. And you can see that there are qualitatively different outcomes. So if you're fairly neutron rich, say, uh, focus uh, on, the, on the black curve uh, for a very low electron fraction, meaning a lot of neutrons, um, you get this abundance pattern that shows this sort of second peak and then the third peak and uh, goes into this uh, range of mass numbers where the lanthanides are, which is the um, sort of second um, to lowest uh, sort of row in the periodic table. And uh, it turns out that these lanthanides have drastically different opacities than all the rest of the elements. Um, and I'll explain this in a, in a second. So it, it very much matters if you, whether or not you actually go into this regime and produce some of the lanthanides or not. If you go to a higher electron fraction, say uh, around 0.2 or so, so let's see the, the, the sort of dashed orange curve, you still uh, form these, uh, these lanthanides, and you can already see that here this first, so-called first peak already starts to rise. And then as you go to an electron fraction about 0.25, um, you don't produce any of the lanthanides anymore, essentially, but you put all the, uh, the final nuclei into this um, regime of what we call the first to second peak. And um, so you end up with a qualitatively different uh, abundance pattern. And in particular, you don't produce lanthanides, so you only have opacities coming from these much uh, lighter nuclei, and they are by orders of magnitude different. Um, and that's the, the important point. And then if you go even higher, sort of if you're not neutron rich anymore, but you have sort of equal numbers of neutrons and protons, so YE.5, you don't produce any of the R process elements anymore. So R, the R process essentially starts at mass numbers around like 70 or something. Um, so you, you only end, end up actually with uh, uh, a peak at uh, 56, which is exactly nickel. And that is what I, as I mentioned earlier this morning, nickel 56 is the radioactive element that powers one supernovae um, and that produces the nuclear heating in that case. So um, that is exactly happening as you go to a higher YE. And that is typically the YE that you get in supernovae where you have ordinary stellar matter that uh, consists of roughly equal numbers of neutrons and protons. So this is uh, exactly consistent with this idea that sort of in supernovae uh, we, would, uh, we would produce um, uh, nickel 56 and power the, uh, the light curve, the transient in this way. Whereas with the R process, we power, uh, we power things with these heavy elements. Okay, so why are now the opacities very different? Um, so why are the, the, the opacities of the lanthanides very different from those of um, sort of other compositions of IRMP composition that we have in, in supernovae? Um, well, there's a very basic atomic physics argument you can, you can make. Um, so let's look at the uh, periodic table here. So the lanthanides and actinides are the bottom two rows here, the, uh, the violet ones. And uh, sort of I've uh, labeled them here um, according to sort of the atomic shells that we have. So we have S-shell elements, D-shell elements, P-shell elements, and F-shell elements. And the, the important distinction between the composition of supernovae and kilonovae is that supernovae are composed of uh, mostly D-shell elements, so iron peak, so what people call iron peak elements, so you see iron is among those D-shell elements. And uh, whereas kilonovae have, uh, have contributions from these F-shell elements. Now, the, the important point to realize here is that the, the opacity uh, that matters actually for these transients is uh, our so-called line expansion opacities. So um, the opacity is determined by how many lines you have how many atomic transitions you have in these atoms, because that is how um, photons get uh, reabsorbed and then finally re-emitted. So as they sort of diffuse out of uh, the ejector shell, they, they, they become absorbed and, and re-emitted all the time. And uh, that, th that can only be done if sort of the, the photon energy hits an atomic transition energy, right? So in order to calculate the opacity of, um, of the material, you have to know where the, the atomic lines of these, um, of these nuclei are. Um, and uh, so it turns out, by basic combinatorics, 
So the opacity is then proportional, essentially, to the number of line transitions you have. So how many combinations you have to uh, absorb the the, um, the photon depends on how, how many um, on on the con on how many configurations you have, how many possibilities you have to shift the electrons around in in that atomic configuration. Um, and you can just by basic combinatorics, um, um, if you have if you have an, uh, a shell, um, atomic shell with uh, G um, levels, um, sort of G atomic levels, and you have n electrons, then the number of combinations you have is uh, uh, um, exactly given by this expression up here. Just very basic uh, combinatorics. Um, now the interesting thing is that um, you have to count all the open shells. So the interesting aspect is that um, the actual opacity will be given by all the configurations that you have to, for shifting around these electrons in all open shells. So they are. So for example, if you go, if you go to the lanthanides and actinides, they have uh, an open D shell and an open F shell. So you have all combinations from the D shell plus all combinations from the F shell. Whereas, for example, for um, uh, D shell, and, and you have also the, the the ones from the P shell actually. So th this actually nicely illustrated up here. Um, if you think of how, so sort of chemically, how electrons, how um, atomic nuclei fill up their electron shells, um, you see here th these are the, the S shells. So it, um, um, these elements they first fill up their the, um, the 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 S shells, and then comes the P shell up here, and then as we go as we come down here, these uh, these atoms f first fill up their D shell before they fill up the P shell. So they have open P and D shells. And then for the lanthanides, it becomes even more dramatic. You have open P shells, open D shells, and open F shells. So you have to multiply all these sort of combinatoric coefficients up here. Um, and uh, that gives you sort of the, the number of configurations, uh, um, uh, electron configurations you have. And this is essentially plotted here in this nice plot that I took from, from Kaysen, from Dan Kaysen's paper in 2013, where he was first pointing out this effect that lanthanides have such a higher opacity than, than other material. And you can see that if you multiply sort of all these combinations from all open shells, the lanthanides, which are in this red band uh, that you see up there, actually have an order of magnitude higher, um, higher um, uh, sort of uh, complexity or number of electron configurations than um, iron peak elements around mass number um, sort of 40 or, um, um, or some, some of the other sort of uh, D shell elements. And that means since the opacity goes with uh, the number of line transitions you have, and the number of line transitions is just proportional to the number of lines or configurations squared, that the opacity can be um, different by, by not only one order of magnitude, but actually by uh, two orders of magnitude. Um, so essentially because of this effect, the opacities can vary by orders of magnitude. Uh, depending on what initial composition you start with. Um, so, and that is exactly why we need to know very precisely from Newton's star merger simulations what is actually the composition, because the, the result for the kilonova will be qualitatively different. So if you do, so this was just like a fairly basic argument how to, how to think about this. If you actually do very detailed atomic uh, calculations, structure calculations, you can actually compute these opacities. Um, and this is done in this in this upper plot um, on 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 the right, um, and you can see these are um, the opacities as a function of wavelength. Um, and I've indicated there the sort of iron peak composition, so that would be the typical composition, for example, of a of a supernova or of um, what we call a blue um, kilonova. And uh, in contrast, you see the opacities of the of the lanthanides. And um, um, as you can see, as you go to a higher wavelengths away from the optical into the near infrared, they actually diverge, and you see that the the opacities are indeed different um, by at least two orders of magnitude. And uh, sort of plugging this information into this basic kilonova model that we that we derived this uh, uh, this morning, uh, you can get transients um, that look uh, essentially roughly like this. So you have um, you can have um, a transient peaking on this um, early time scale. So let me let me actually again write write this down just to remind you of the the expression that we had um, written down earlier today. Where is it? Here. So at some point this morning we derived this peak time scale, which is 1.2 days. 
um, for typical parameters, MEJ over 10 to minus 2 m sun to the minus 1 half, uh, 1 half, sorry. And then typical velocity of 0.1 c to the minus 1 half, and then kappa over 1 centimeter squared per gram to the 1 half. So this essentially is exactly explains this, this, this peak time scale. So if we have um, uh, typical uh, opacities of a sort of iron peak composition, we peak at a sort of a daytime scale, it gives us um, sort of uh, an optical transient that will actually peak in the, in, in the optical uh, that requires this high electron fraction, so not crazy high neutron richness in the, in the original outflow. And in contrast, uh, if we have um, at least a small amount of lanthanides present, and the mass fraction uh, in order to do that, um, the sufficient mass fraction to do that is already on the order of 10 to minus uh, 3 or so. So even if you, if you produce a tiny amount of these lanthanides, they will totally dominate the opacity, the overall opacity of the material, and will then actually make this transient peak on a weak time scale, and uh, it will actually peak in the, in the near-infrared. So you actually need um, sort of near-infrared uh, telescopes uh, to actually see that. If you had a, an optical telescope, you would simply miss that. Um, so these are the sort of lanthanide-rich or high-opacity, low-YE infrared kilonovae. OK, um, any questions so far? All right, then uh, let's move on. And uh, let's move on to the, to the third point, uh, namely the um, characteristics of, um, sort of the other characteristics of the, of the ejector. Um, and as I said, we, in order to sort of understand that, we have to look at numerical simulations. There's simply no way we can infer these parameters um, sort of with some accuracy uh, without doing uh, numerical simulations. And in particular for this, we need numerical relativity that you uh, heard about um, uh, last week. And we need also hydrodynamics, which uh, uh, Lewis has um, already talked about. Um, so we need to combine them and, and actually uh, simulate neutron star mergers uh, numerically in, uh, on big supercomputers. And so it turns out from doing that, um, that essentially the the phenomenology, there can be a fairly rich phenomenology of neutron star mergers depending on the initial parameters and the types of systems you, you look at. Um, so in general, we can, we can think of neutron star neutron star mergers or uh, black hole neutron star mergers. Um, so as Louis already explained uh, um, earlier today, a black hole neutron star merger and this neutron star um, actually does not get tidally disrupted by the black hole. It just plunges into the black hole. You'll see that we'll just end up with a final black hole and there's nothing interesting happening because none of the material will actually stay outside the event horizon and produce any observable electromagnetic emission. So that's kind of boring from the electromagnetic point of view. Um, however, if the uh, black hole actually manages to tidally disrupt the neutron star, uh, we'll, we'll actually form uh, an accretion disk around this, uh, around this black hole and, and, and Lewis was already showing this. Uh, which is already a, a fairly interesting system for reasons that I'll, uh, that I'll explain in a couple of minutes. On the other hand, uh, if you look at neutron star neutron star mergers, uh, they can do the same thing. They can essentially fairly promptly lead to the collapse um, of this sort of final, uh, of this sort of merger product uh, to a black hole that will then also be surrounded by uh, accretion disk, by an accretion disk of some mass. So a fairly similar system. Or um, if the uh, the system doesn't uh, promptly collapse to a black hole. It uh, forms uh, what we call a so-called supermassive or hypermassive neutron star that at least survives for some time, depending on uh, angular momentum transport processes that we also don't uh, really understand or fully understand yet. And uh, so these timescales, so the, the lifetimes of these objects are, uh, are still fairly uncertain, but at some point uh, they can again collapse um, to a black hole surrounded by some um, accretion torus, or they actually form um, a fairly long-lived, very long-lived neutron star that can survive on what we call spin-down timescales. It can be hours to days, uh, and it can still finally collapse, or actually forms a stable, uh, stable neutron star remnant. And that's an option that is also uh, still on the table. It very much, of course, depends on what the maximum mass for, um, um, for, for neutron stars is. Um, so it depends on the equation of state that we, that we don't know yet. Um, and so in this sort of rich phenomenology, you can have various 
um, ejection mechanisms um, that give rise to ejection of neutron-rich material that can then undergo the, the R process. So as, as I mentioned earlier this, this morning, I, I was showing you the, the, the first kilonova that we've observed uh, last year. And I, noticed, and I noted that it actually had two components, uh, a blue component and a red component. And so from, from knowing sort of the phenomen phenomenology of these systems uh, numerically, this is exactly what you would essentially expect. You have many different eject ejection mechanisms. So it, it kind of seems natural that uh, some of them sort of superimpose to give um, uh, sort of multi-component kilonova. So you, you don't have just like sort of one peak, but you, have, you could have actually multiple peaks. And, and these peaks would typically be in different, at different wavelengths um, depending on the composition of this, of, of this ejection material. So, um, and this slide essentially summarizes uh, some of the ejection mechanisms that we know of uh, so far. Uh, and I'll just like fairly briefly go through them um, um, step by step just to show you what the typical characteristics of these different ejections are. So there's, uh, of course, this class of uh, so-called dynamical ejector, which is the one that has been known for the longest time, um, has been already realized back in uh, 1976 by Latimer and Schramm uh, that uh, neutron star black hole uh, mergers, or then late, just one or two years after, neutron star neutron star system could tidally eject material into, into outer space that would be uh, uh, neutron rich. There are winds from from this uh, remnant uh, hypermassive or supermassive neutron star that can be ejected on, on longer time scales of tens of milliseconds to, uh, to a second or so. And finally, in the, in the post-merger system, um, we, we form this accretion disk, as I, as I showed. And these accretion disks, as we fa found only fairly recently, can actually give rise to a lot of mass ejection. And, uh, and actually, I'll, I'll show you in a second that the outflows from this post-merger accretion disk may actually dominate the total mass ejection of all other of, of all other um, ejection uh, channels. And um, so let me just sort of br briefly characterize all these different uh, e ejection um, uh, channels. So uh, tidal ejector, that's the one that comes out at the earliest time, at the earliest time in the, in the merger process. Um, so the, as the two neutron stars uh, in spiral and then uh, shortly before merger, uh, they come fairly close. The tidal forces become fairly strong um, between these two neutron stars, and these tidal forces actually rip apart some of the material from the outer parts of the neutron stars. And uh, those, uh, that material actually leaks out through the sort of Lagrange points of, of the system um, in, in are sort of ejected in, in tails, um, in these sort of tail or spiral-like structures um, due to the rotation that you can see there in, this, in, 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 uh, in, in that frame. Um, they are typically fairly fast because uh, the, the, essentially the, the velocity is determined by the orbital velocity of the neutron stars, which is fairly high at, uh, shortly before merger. And that depends a little bit on the equation of state. So the, the, sort of, uh, the smaller the neutron star radii, uh, radii are, the, the further the two, the closer the, the two objects come together. And uh, so sort of the deeper in the potential well you are, um, and that can uh, that means that the they, they have sort of higher velocities, um, typically on the order of uh, sort of twenty percent the speed of light or so, the typical number. Uh, they are fairly cool, uh, so this, this is very cold and very neutron rich material because it's just material ripped off from the neutron stars. Uh, so it has essentially zero temperature if you want. Uh, so very very small specific entropy, um, and it's very neutron rich. So with uh, electron fractions below 0.1, and uh, that would then typically lead, um, according to you know sort of all the, what we discussed so far, uh, um, knowing fairly cold uh, and, uh, and low electron fraction um, that would lead to a sort of fast red kilonova transient um, that moves, uh, as I said, uh, with 20% of the speed of light or so. Then on the, as the two neutron stars touch, a strong hydrodynamic shock forms in the interface of the two neutron stars. Um, and that hydrodynamic shock actually dissipates kinetic energy into heat. And uh, so you, you have this sort of uh, layer of this shock that heats up the material and actually sort of squeezes out material uh, from this shock interface. And uh, that is, again, on, on dynamical uh, scales, which means that the, the velocities are actually fairly high. The ejector velocities can be uh, at least 20% the speed of light, and they can actually go even up to 0.8 for like a small amount of material or so. But um, sort of these shock collisions usually give rise to, to fairly fast um, um, ejector. And this has been heated, 
as I mentioned, by the, by the shock and uh, heated to temperatures um, of something like 10 MeV or so, uh, where we are on the weak time, uh, energy scale already. So that means that a lot of neutrinos are uh, emitted at these temperatures. And um, the, these very strong uh, neutrino radiation um, has a very interesting effect, namely that these neutrinos um, can be absorbed by beta uh, processes, uh, again, in, in, the, um, uh, in, in, in the ejector material, and actually change the composition again. So um, actually these, neutri uh, these neutrinos uh, change the electron fraction and raise it up to values of typically where the, where the sort of the mean electron fraction is typically above 0.25. Now, if you remember the plot that I've shown you uh, a couple of slides ago, uh, here, if you look if you look at this y e 0.25 here under typical conditions again, uh, you see that we don't form any of the lanthanides anymore, right? So we have this blue curve, this blue dash dotted curve, and uh, so this is already qualitatively different from uh, sort of the uh, fr from the tidal ejector, which was cold and very neutron rich and produced um, a lot of lanthanides. So in this case, we're in this regime where we don't produce any lanthanides, so the opacities are much lower, and that means that we get an optical transient, uh, so-called blue kilonova, and so in this case, we'll have a fast blue uh, kilonova. So fast red versus uh, fast blue from dynamical ejector. And then it'll depend on, you know, sort of what sort of ki what kind of process actually wins, uh, uh, and that that'll de determine sort of the overall sort of kilonova component from the from the dynamic ejector. Now, if you don't promptly collapse to a black hole, as I mentioned, you form this supermassive or hypermassive neutron star, and uh, here you have two additional mechanisms that can give rise to mass ejection, uh, namely winds. You can drive winds off from the surface of this uh, newly formed uh, neutron star, from this newly formed object, in two ways. Um, either uh, via neutrino um, um, absorption, so this is fairly similar to uh, the case of Ocalab supernovae, where you form a proto-neutron star that is hot and radiates a lot of neutrinos. These neutrinos get reabsorbed by sort of um, uh, material at the sort of surface and in the in the outer atmosphere, and that actually drives they they reabsorb there, they deposit their energy there, and uh, and that actually drives an outflow, and uh, this is how um, um, there's a so-called so super um, um, uh, neutrino mechanism in core collapse supernovae, and something similar, uh, a different version of this, um, can operate here, where neutrinos again from this from this shock heated hot uh, hypermassive supermassive neutron star actually drive a wind from its own surface and give rise to mass ejection. In this case, um, the uh, velocities are fairly slow um, uh, because uh, you really have to uh, have a fairly high neutrino lumino luminosity to actually get an outflow. Uh, so the, the typical um, uh, velocity scales are here like 0.1 c or, or even slower than that. Um, as I mentioned, they are fairly hot because um, I've been um, they, they are driven from this hot neutron star surface, uh, something like 10 MeV or so, and uh, due to the neutrino absorption, the, um, again, the electron fraction will be fairly high, so you won't produce uh, significant amounts of lanthanides, and um, the typical mass uh, ejection rates are something like 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus uh, 3 solar mass per second. And uh, so this would overall result in essentially a slow blue kilonova uh, uh, transient, so high so low neutron richness um, and uh, uh, small velocities. On the other hand, you can have another ejection mechanism, namely biomagnetic fields. So what will happen is that in the interior of the neutron star, magnetic fields will be amplified, and this amplification will lead to strong um, so-called toroidal magnetic fields in the interior. And these uh, and the gradients, or sort of the gradient of this toroidal field, will drive. Um, will drive a wind from the surface of this neutron star, which is a sort of a mechanism that we only like sort of discovered a couple of years ago, in, uh, um, in, that we found essentially in these in, in, in these simulations. So essentially, the magnetic the magnetic pressure that is built up in the interior uh, unbinds, lifts up material out of the potential of that neutron star and drives an, an outflow. These are also fairly slow winds, uh, typically 10% the speed of light or so. Again, fairly hot because the neutron star is hot. Um, and uh, neutrinos um, are also radiated, of course, in this in this context. So, I mean, both mechanisms occur at the same time in some sense. Um, so the, the electron fraction, again, will be fairly high. 
um, the mass loss rates can actually be a little higher than, than for the neutrino-driven uh, mechanism. Um, at least um, that's what we find in simulations. And so again, this will also contribute to a slow blue kilonova transient. And fairly interestingly, depending on the regime in which you are with these magnetic fields, um, so how so sort of what the competition between the the um, sort of internal energy of the of the fluid and the the magnetic energy of the fluid um, you can have situations in which um, sort of the magnetic fields can actually when the magnetic fields are sort of magnetic energy density dominates um, you can have scenarios in which these magnetic fields can actually accelerate the neutrino driven wind so sort of both mechanisms can act together and the magnetic fields can actually um, um, uh, sort of accelerate the outflow to uh, higher velocities and in this case you would have actually a fast blue kilonova component component. Um, and uh, so that was fairly recently pointed out by, um, by Brian Metzger. And, um, but it's still to be, to be tested with, uh, uh, with actual simulations. Um, but so, so if these are typical um, mechanisms that we think of when you, uh, once you create um, a, a neutron star in the, in the merger process. So just to illustrate this, this is uh, one movie uh, showing uh, the merger of two neutron stars. And um, so now they've uh, already merged. You can see sort of this red stuff uh, out there is essentially uh, this uh, early tidal ejector. Um, and uh, the blue material is uh, sort of more the shock heated um, e ejector in this case. And um, as I go on with the simulation, you see at fairly late times, uh, now that you, say, you see some sort of stable wind being driven from the surface of the neutron star. In this case, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's this magnetically driven wind, actually, um, because we didn't have neutrinos in the simulation in, in, in this case. So here you can see this late time wind. So this is actually a system that forms um, a very long-lived uh, neutron star. So it doesn't collapse to a, to a black hole. And um, so now this is just rotated by 80 degrees. So we've, we've looked at the, at the equatorial plane before, and this is now just like um, uh, rotated by 90 degrees. You, you see again the two neutron stars merging and giving rise to the shock heated ejector and tidal ejector. And finally, uh, you'll see these sort of blue winds uh, coming out um, from the neutron star. OK, and finally, sort of the last uh, mechanism is sort of the final stage of the merger process once uh, um, things have settled down. And uh, um, in many cases, you would form a black hole that is surrounded by some accretion disk. Um, effectively, the same, I mean, at least qualitatively, the same uh, scenario would apply, or the same physics would apply in the case where you had a sort of stable neutron star, and you would have a stable neutron star surrounded by some um, accretion disk. And sort of, uh, the physics of, this, of these systems are actually fairly interesting. Um, so it turns out that these accretion disks um, launch thermal winds from, the, from the, what we call sort of the corona of, of these accretion disks. And um, it turns out that these uh, winds can be fairly massive. So why do we actually uh, eject winds? Well, there's uh, an imbalance. So so let me show this, this plot here. So the, these, are, these essentially show space-time diagrams, if you want, <laughs> um, of various quantities. And so the, uh, the, the, upper, uh, the upper panel shows uh, um, essentially what uh, in, in other fields of astrophysics is called um, um, a butterfly diagram. It shows dynamo activity. So what's going on in this disk is that you have MHD turbulence and uh, there's the so-called magnetorotational instability that uh, mediates MHD turbulence. And that turbulence uh, um, mediates angular momentum transport, which means that uh, material has to gradually sort of falls into the black hole, into the potential of the black hole. And in doing so, it's actually heated up because all the uh, sort of gravitational binding energy eventually goes into heat. And uh, so as the material is, uh, by MHD turbulence, is driven into the potential of the black hole, it heats up. And uh, sort of in, in, in order to counteract this, this heating, there is um, at some point neutrino cooling, because at some point the material will be so hot that, again, you're at temperatures of MeV scale, and uh, neutrino uh, radiation will set in, and uh, the disk will uh, emit neutrinos. And that's the way how this, how this disk cools. Um, in the upper panel, you can see how this magnetic uh, fields, how uh, sort of uh, MHD turbulence uh, generates um, 
uh, magnetic fields in the disk midplane. So this is the intensity essentially of the toroidal magnetic field strength as a function of time, where I averaged over some radial part of the uh, radial part of the disk. Um, and uh, um, as a function of height, so at the, at the center you have the disk midplane. So you see that in the in the uh, sort of uh, color coded is the, is the strength, and you, you can see that the highest, the strongest magnetic fields are created in the midplane, and then they sort of gradually uh, 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 migrate off the midplane and dissipate into heat at higher latitudes. So the you see the color uh, becomes uh, lighter as you go as you go off the midplane. And uh, in the middle, in the mid, uh, in the center panel, you see the specific entropy, which is essentially an indicator of heat, if you want, of the heat produced. And you see that um, the it's actually coolest in the midplane, and then at high latitudes, um, that's where the density has has dropped a lot. Um, so neutrino cooling is not efficient anymore. So only this viscous heating through MHD turbulence actually heats up this uh, the, the corona a lot, and the material can't cool. It can't emit um, uh, neutrinos anymore. It can only uh, emit neutrinos in the midplane where the densities are high enough. And that's what you can see at the in the lower panel, which uh, shows you essentially the neutrino, the, the neutrino emissivity, um, which clearly peaks in the, in the midplane. So what happens at these high latitudes is that um, you have you deposit tons of uh, thermal energy energy there, and this thermal energy will uh, uh, just launch a thermal wind. And that's exactly the, the nature of this, of this mechanism um, that leads to a quite substantial um, um, mass, mass loss from this disk. We typically find that uh, you can unbind essentially 30 to 40 percent of the initial disk mass uh, through these winds. And if you plug in sort of typical numbers for the accretion disks that you that you form after the merger, you find that essentially the the mass scale um, for the total so the total mass ejection in this case would be something of the order of 10 to the minus two solar masses. And if you compare this with other with some of the other channels, it's actually um, uh, substantial. Um, so, um, at least in some cases, it, can, it, it could clearly dominate some of the other mass ejection um, uh, mechanisms. And uh, so, one, one word on uh, the, the composition. So, we find these outflows, and I'll, I'll show this uh, in the colloquium on, on Wednesday um, in a little more detail. We actually find that these outflows, uh, due to very interesting physics, are actually neutron-rich, um, which is something that naively you wouldn't assume. And... Um, so the electron fraction actually stays below this sort of critical threshold 0.25 for lanthanide production. So you actually do produce um, a lot of lanthanides in these outflows, which means again that the opacity is very high and uh, sort of we produce a red kilonova component um, if you want. And uh, it's going to be slow because, as I mentioned, these winds are actually fairly uh, slow. They're typically on the order of, uh, say, 10% the speed of light. Um, however, if you have actually a neutron star at the center, you can do you can sort of play the same game and put a neutron star at the center. The neutron star at the center again will uh, emit a lot of neutrinos that will be reabsorbed by the outflows of this accretion disk, and that would raise the electron fraction. So if you put an, uh, a stable neutron star at the center, uh, you could actually raise this electron fraction about, uh, above this critical threshold of 0.25, and you would actually um, um, uh, assume that. Um, um, you'd form a, uh, a lanthanide poor outflow, in which case you'd have a, a blue kilonova. So essentially the question whether you produce a slow red or slow blue kilonova with these accretion disks depends on what you have as the final remnant um, of the merger, which again depends on um, 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 sort of the, the binary parameters and the equation of state. Okay, so putting sort of all this together, um, we find the following picture essentially. Uh, so with these dynamical channels, uh, we find typically something on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 3 solar masses or so, um, maybe even lower, um, relatively fast typically, uh, both components of 20% uh, the speed of light or so. Uh, these winds, as I mentioned, are fairly uh, slow. And uh, so typical mass loss could be something on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 4, depending on how, how long the neutron star actually lives. Uh, and then finally, we have, as I, and then sort of, as I mentioned, from all these classical channels, you, you have then something, in total, something on the order of 10 to the minus 3. If you stretch it to the limit, may, maybe 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. 
And uh, then from the sort of post-merge accretion disk, um, we get something on the order of 10 to the minus 2 solar masses, which was actually the sort of mass scale inferred from the kilonova observations. And um, I'll, co I'll comment on this um, in a little more detail on, um, on Wednesday then, because uh, time is already up. Any questions or Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, so so the the point is that so all of this I mean especially the so for for the opacities I, I mean uh, what was implicitly assumed all, all the time is that you don't form dust. Um, so once you form dust, then the opacities are uh, very different, anyways, and it's a yet totally unsolved problem what uh, actually the opacities of kilonova dust would look like, <laughs> for example. Um, so that, that that is a very hard that, that's a very hard question. Um, uh, but in, so I mean the basic formalism still applies, but at at the late stages, of course, once the material cools down a lot, at at some point you 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 will form dust. Um, but the physics of this is not yet understood, um, and uh, but it might be actually fairly interesting because um, in the future, once we have JWST, um, that will hopefully uh, actually take data in a in a couple of years from now. Um, it is, it's it's been constantly delayed. Um, but so so JWST will be very sensitive, uh, and uh, so we might be able, or at least we have the hope that we can follow up Kilonovi at fairly long. Uh, times so first from the sort of photospheric stage where sort of all the physics applies that that I that I discussed to um, what then observers call the nebula phase things become optically thin and you get uh, sort of nebula emission and the physics of that for kilonovi is still also totally not understood <laughs> and at some point you will also form dust which is an even harder problem and maybe uh, sort of with uh, future very sensitive infrared telescopes we might actually be able to probe that and that is f from the sort of physics point of view but physics point of view very exciting Uh, I think 